Good afternoon. My name is George Nicholas, and I'd like to welcome you to the second of the Protecting Indigenous Cultural Heritage Lectures, which are part of the, the President's Dream Colloquium. And before we get, go any further, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Rudy Reimer Youngsk, to give uh, an introduction and, and welcome. Hutchka Tanayap, Siam Siites, Kayachtin, Thok Thok Kwaitin, SFU Lam, Sko Omish, Tabeach, Slewatooth, Tameach, Tabathquim, Tameach, Stopmoth, Tameach, Kayachtin, Greetings, uh, honored guests, friends, uh, family, elders, uh, colleagues. Uh, I've been asked by my academic friends, family, colleagues here at SFU uh, to offer a short welcome to uh, what I refer to as Stotmuth, uh, Indigenous Territories. Uh, we say Coast Salish in anthropology, archaeology circles. Uh, but to us as Indigenous people, we are Stotmouth, we are human beings. And on behalf of the local groups who share and have occupied this territory for thousands of years, I'd just like to welcome you to this place of learning. Thuk Thuk Weichin is the place name of this mountain. Nowadays we call it Burnaby Mountain or SFU, but Thuk Thuk Waitin is a name that's been shared uh, amongst the Coast Salish groups here. And its translation is a place of peeling arbutus and cedar bark. And arbutus is an important medicine, and cedar an important material for a variety of purposes. And so here today, it, it, we're going to experience some good medicine, some good thoughts. So I'm glad. George has asked me and others who have organized and part of this uh, series uh, to allow me to come and briefly welcome you in a traditional way that follows our protocol. So I'll turn it over to George. Thank you. Quite you come. It is my great pleasure to bring my colleague, my friend Ian Lilly here today and in our tribal protocols, this of course requires that I give you his, uh, just a boiled down version of his ex very extensive and impressive credentials. Um, Ian is professor in Aboriginal and Torres Islander, uh, Strait, uh, sorry, Torres Strait Islander studies at the University of Queensland in Australia. And there he's got the absolutely enormous task of overseeing the program's teaching, research consultancy, and publications program. He has worked in Austra uh, Australasian and Indo-Pacific uh, archaeology and, and cultural heritage management for over 30 years. Much of his Pacific research has focused on European trading systems uh, in the islands off of New Guinea. He's also participated in major international projects in tropical Australia and Melanesia. Uh, and has undertaken his own research in northeastern Australia and uh, southwestern uh, parts of the country. He currently works in, in uh, coastal northern Australia and in New Caledonia. His interests include migration and trade, social identity, archaeological ethics, uh, and importantly, the role of archaeology and cultural heritage in contemporary society. He's published extensively on this work, as you may imagine, uh, with numerous book chapters. His most recent publication, or rather his most re recent book, is Archaeology of Oceania, Ar uh, Australia, and the Pacific Islands. Uh, Professor Lilly is ICOMOS's national, or International Committee on uh, Archaeological Heritage Management uh, Secretary General, uh, and an ICOMOS World Heritage As Assessor. He's also the Secretary General of the Indo-Pacific Prehistory Association, the region's leading uh, professional archaeological body, as well as convener of the International Heritage Group, which is a heritage capacity building NGO that Ian founded while a uh, prof um, professorial fellow at Oxford in 2011. 
Uh, Dr. Ian Lilly is past secretary of the World Archaeological Congress and served three consecutive terms as a president of the Australian Archaeological Association and 10 years on the executive committee of the Indo-Pacific Prehistory Association. He's a fellow of both the Society of Antiqu Antiquaries of London and the Australian Academy of Humanities, uh, as well as a senior associate of Global Heritage Assessment and Advice and a member of the Intellectual Property Issues and Cultural Heritage uh, Project, where I've got the pleasure of working with, with Ian closely. The work that Ian speaks of today is of great significance in the realm of heritage, but also, as you will see, how that intersects with many other dimensions of people's lives, both locally and globally. Please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Ian Lilly. Welcome everybody, thanks for coming. Um, it's really nice to see everybody here, friends from uh, different parts of uh, Canada today. And, uh, oh, excuse me, as George said, I'm gonna be talking about um, ownership of world heritage within a global, oh, sorry, ownership of indigenous heritage within a global context, the, the, particularly the context of world heritage. Before I start though, I'd like to thank George for bringing me over. Um, it's a long way to swim, so we managed to uh, find an airplane that was coming this way. And uh, I've got a few extra days here, so I'll be able to catch up with some, some uh, friends while I'm here. I'd also like to thank uh, the Coast Salish people on whose land we gather today. Uh, it's an important um, point, particularly when I'm talking about Indigenous cultural heritage, to acknowledge the uh, local Indigenous owners. So. In this talk, which is going to be very practice focused rather than highly theoretical, I'll give you a bit of background, a little potted history, very simplified version of things, discuss the main players in the world that I'll be, be sketching out for you. We'll look then at the issues that arise, some directions forward. If we've got time, I'll have a look at some uh, case studies, some current examples some of which are actually in train now, so we have to be a little bit circumspect, and then we'll have um, discussion and questions. If you have any burning questions, please keep them to the end, otherwise I'm gonna lose track, and it's very easy to sidetrack me. Okay, this is a very short and sweet version of the background, but global actors uh, such as the UN system, which is unimaginably vast and complicated, the, what we call the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, which were set up at Bretton Woods uh, in New Hampshire, and also modern uh, transnational corporations, global capital, have had a profound impact on indigenous cultural heritage for a long time, and particularly since the Second World War. And as I said, this is the short and sweet version, but in the same period, European colonialism has waned across most of the world, and indigenous people's rights and interests have become increasingly recognised and respected. This recognition and respect has, however, only very recently uh, extended out to cover, or explicitly at least, cover cultural heritage. And while, as I hope I'll show today, we're making a lot of progress, we still, by the same token, have a very long way to go. This is not, here we go, okay. Now we'll go through the groups of players one by one very quickly. Some of you will know this, some of you won't. UNESCO was founded after World War II on earlier foundations such as the League of Nations and so on, uh, bodies that were associated with the League of Nations rather, and it was originally set up to rebuild education systems in the devastation, following the devastation of the Second World War. Cultural heritage was added to the mix owing to, it was all very gentlemanly and mostly <coughs> manly in those days, gentlemanly, uh, with people sort of scholars who had worked for spy agencies but also knew somebody, set up something, were collectors. They gradually pulled together, um, and with people like the Monuments Men of recent George Clooney film fame, pulled together a sort of loose coalition of people interested in cultural heritage and kind of injected themselves into the, the uh, evolving UNESCO system. A few were ostensibly reformed looters, um, which is always a curious thing to read about. People who became very famous proponents of cultural heritage management, starting like Malraux, started life as looters. Okay, this UNESCO system 
There's something very strange about the, the uh, I don't know whether it's affecting you, but when I move around, does it change the, I'll try and stand still. Um, this system started to evolve heritage management conventions almost from the start. So we had the Hague Convention on uh, the Protection of Heritage in Times of Armed Conflict in 54 from memory. A whole lot of other ones, uh, Venice Charters and Malta Charters and this charter and that charter. The World Heritage Convention, probably the best known, certainly the best subscribed international heritage convention. Um, nearly every country in the world has signed up to it. it was first, uh, first promulgated in 1972. It wasn't until 1995, however, that a specifically archaeological uh, charter was, was um, promulgated, and that's the charter that um, my international, that my, this international scientific committee that I run for ECOMOS um, is specifically there to, uh, to enable. Okay, now inside the World Heritage System that was built on the World Heritage Convention in 1972, there's a permanent secretariat in Paris, a bureau, um, and it reports to and manages the business of the World Heritage Committee. Inconveniently for people who like acronyms, they're both called WHC, so you have to know which one you're talking about. But the World Heritage Committee is the one that makes all the decisions, and it's a group of... Um, uh, it's a sort of group of rotating membership of, of nation states that these days lobby very hard to get on there to, uh, to get uh, their sites recognised as a point which we'll come back to. The World Heritage Centre and the World Heritage Committee are both advised by independent statutory bodies. They're called the advisory bodies. There's actually three of them. One is called ICROM. It lives in Rome. The acronym and the name don't actually match at all, um, and I can't remember the name, but it's, to, it's a training institution primarily. The other two, which are, are far more important, if you like, in the day-to-day -day running of the World Heritage System, are ICOMOS, the International Committee on Monuments and Sites, which is the one for culture, it's based in Paris, and the IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which is based just outside uh, Geneva. They're quite differently constituted. Although they have the same job in the World Heritage System, they're quite differently constituted. And the most important result of that uh, for us in, in this context is that ICOMOS is tiny and poor. It's like three girls and a cat in an apartment in outer Paris. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kid you not. The IUCN, on the other hand, is a giant global corporation. It has a beautiful brand new 20 plus million dollar Swiss, no, million dollar Swiss franc building in, in Glan. Um, it's got a thousand permanent staff all over the world. It's quite a different organisation. And that's because uh, if you read the constitutions um, of the two organisations, one is set up uh, as a group of amateurs. And they just kind of expressly in there. And they like to stay that way in the French sense of amateur. The IUCN has whole nations as its member, and so it gets giant subventions of money. Okay. Now, technically, these two bodies are formally linked in the World Heritage System, but in practice, they're almost entirely separate. They're not only housed in different places, they work completely differently. Their philosophies are different, and there's very little collegial collaboration, which is a, an important point for what I'll talk about through this through this uh, lecture today. Okay, the next group of players are the development banks led by the World Bank. Now, the World Bank is a complex um, set of institutions, and there's bits that we would all recognise as the World Bank, and there are these other bits out there that are technically part of the World Bank, like the International Finance Corporation, the IFC, um, which most people don't even know exist, really, but most people don't think of as the World Bank. There's also the IMF. These are these Bretton Woods institutions, as I said, established after the Second World War to rebuild Europe and rebuild the global financial system. And they meet every year to harmonise uh, their approaches to everything, including cultural heritage. Now, how you might wonder, do these people affect what we do? Well, their heritage, indigenous and other social and environmental safeguards reach out into the world of archaeology and cultural heritage management a very long way. They fund enormous amounts of archaeological work, uh, particularly in compliance with these safeguards, um, which were imposed in the 80s after lots of criticism from civil society organisations about the impacts of World Bank um, um, programs. 
interestingly, from our point of view, the heritage safeguard, which is called OP411, was the last one formalised. It wasn't formalised until the 2000s. In fact, I went to the WAC Congress in Washington, D.C. in 2005, and they were still thinking about applying, uh, appointing someone to run that safeguard. They never appointed anyone. Okay, there are 10 safeguards. There are nine permanent staff looking after them. Heritage doesn't get one. It's a very interesting situation. Now, that's the World Bank system. It's the 800-pound gorilla. There are all these other regional development banks, the African Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank. They all have very similar setups in a whole lot of ways, including in their environmental and social safeguards, including cultural heritage. And they all follow, pretty much follow suit with the World Bank. And so heritage, in all of those cases, is the kind of red-headed cousin. Okay. The, the World Bank uh, safeguards are currently being reviewed. Like, as we speak, they're being reviewed, and Andy Mason and I and uh, other people are working with a variety of international organisations that we're part of around the world um, to contribute to this review, because when they were first formulated and in, in subsequent reviews, there was no professional archaeological or cultural heritage input into any of these, uh, in any of these programs. They've got contract staff and they, had, they, they enlisted the uh, aid of, of various professionals, but in addition to not having a permanent staff member inside the bank, people from outside the bank, like us, didn't make any contribution. We're remedying that now. The other way that the bank and similar organisations, these giant financial uh, powerhouses affect what we do is through heritage as development. As opposed to heritage in development, compliance archaeology, compliance heritage, they use heritage projects, very famously, for example, the big, um, I forget what it was called, the um, souk, the market, traditional market in Fez in Morocco, very famous early, early example, but other cases, Angkor is another case, where they inject enormous sums of money into cultural heritage restoration and conservation projects as a form of development. It's primarily for cultural heritage, tourism and connected uh, projects. Okay. Now, interestingly, this group of players is very closely linked to the UN system. They use all the same language. Quite often the people move backwards and forwards. There's no continuing formal links on heritage, at least. In fact, there's a lot of, um, what would you call it, animosity, friction because the World Bank always thinks that UNESCO is asking for money, which it always is. Uh, and the World Bank says, this is the World Bank, for God's sake. They say, we have no money. <laughs> okay. But they're also connected through things like the UN. Lots of acronyms here. This thing isn't... Hello. The UN Development Pro uh, Program, the UN Environment Program, through UNESCO and so on. So there's links between the World Bank and its various parts and the UN system, particularly uh, UNESCO, and through that ICOMOS and so on. Okay, the third group of players are global corporations. Okay. Now, to cut a very complex story short, the biggest concern for us as cultural heritage managers, as archaeologists, for indigenous people, are probably the extractives, as they're called. Forestry, but particularly mining and gas. We add to that mix the institutions, the financial institutions that back these people, always follow the money. Okay. This group of players is a very interesting group to work amongst. Lots of us in this room have or will uh, work with one or more of these, these people, Rio Tinto, BHP, Glencore, I know there's Canadian ones, the names of which I can't remember at the moment. They generate an enormous amount of archaeological business, basically. And it's the mining and gas that generate probably most of it. But they cannot operate without those financial institutions. So it's important to sort of keep them in the mix. Now, curiously, at least some of these mining companies get money from an organ of the World Bank, the IFC, which is the World Bank for Private Enterprise. So Rio Tinto, for example, gets money from the IFC to do work in Guinea or Mongolia. Okay? So they're all connected. Now, all the majors, as we call them, the big companies, all have social uh, and environmental policies, usually under corporate response, social responsibility programs, CSR. 
All of them, to my knowledge, include uh, Indigenous issues as um, a central, central uh, plank in their programs. They also all include cultural heritage. Interestingly, they're all generally based on World Bank standards. And remember, the World Bank itself refers back to UNESCO. So we've got this sort of group of people that uh, ostensibly operate in very, very different sectors of, the, of, the, uh, of planetary activity, if you like, but they're all actually linked. Okay? So the, the, I don't know, the Rio Tinto uh, heritage guidelines will explicitly refer to the World Bank or particularly the IFC ones, and if you read them, they refer back to the World Heritage and other UNESCO type documents. Interestingly, in addition to the actual individual um, corporations, they're, they're unions, if you like. They're overarching representative bodies, they're industry groups like the International Council for Memory for Minerals and Metals. This next one doesn't actually have a name. If you actually go to their website, this, I, whatever it is, that one, it doesn't really have a name. It's a bit odd. It used to have a name, but now it just has an acronym that bears no relationship to its old name. Go figure. Okay, but it's the it's the um, um, gas industry uh, body for looking after the environment and the heritage. Okay, they all have uh, safeguard programs or safeguard policies, um, which are voluntary but are binding on their members. Um, they also all have specific guidance on indigenous issues. Um, none really have explicit, at least lengthy um, or detailed guidance about cultural heritage. The, the um, I don't even know how to, know how to say it, the IPESA, IPECA, uh, do mention cultural heritage in here and there, but it's not, it's, it's just in passing. Both, however, the ICMM's um, indigenous uh, policies are currently under review. I've just sent in some stuff to IPECA, IPECA, uh, on cultural heritage as well, so we're trying to beef them up. So these overarching groups, as well as the individual companies within them, all have both indigenous uh, policies and procedures and cultural heritage policies and procedures, which link back to the World Bank and the financial institutions, which then link back into the UNESCO system. So three groups of interrelated overlapping players. Now, just before I go on, a lot of this stuff that these companies do is frequently and justifiably dismissed as greenwash or a, a, a term that's now, because of these links with the UN system, uh, called blue wash. Um, however, on a number of occasions in recent years, we've been able to use their own policies and particularly the uh, charters of these overarching industry groups to hold companies to account. So if they're operating in, there was a case in an African nation, which I won't identify, and it was an Australian company that they basically told the local archaeologists and heritage managers to go jump. They wrote to me and I said, well, curiously, Company X is actually a member of this organisation Y, and guess what? Organisation Y has a policy which says that companies must not do these things. And they took that back to both the company and to the overarching organisation, and they were held to account. So they do have some uses. Okay. So let's have a look at the issues. So I'm here to talk about the ownership, who owns Indigenous heritage, but in the context that I'm discussing, we can't isolate ownership as a standalone question, a standalone problem. In the global context, it's really part of a bundle of issues surrounding recognition and respect. Okay? And the other bits of this bundle are questions as uh, profoundly as, are there in fact Indigenous people? Is Indigenous heritage worthy of any serious attention? Things that you thought we'd actually dealt with a long time ago. Okay. In the global context, these are still there. In the middle, okay, we say that there are Indigenous people, we say that Indigenous heritage warrants attention, we then say, well, Indigenous people should own their own heritage. This is actually still a question. And on the basis that they own their heritage, we would normally say that their permission, their free prior informed consent, the FPIC, as we call it, is required to work with that heritage. Is it? And finally, that Indigenous approaches to Indigenous heritage should be respected and adopted. Really? 
You would think that we've dealt with that. At the international level, these questions are all still live. So let's go through them one by one. That there are Indigenous people. Well, we witnessed a few minutes ago a fairly clear demonstration, I think, that of course there are Indigenous people. And neither of the uh, Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank, IMF, or any of those people, nor major global corporations question the existence of Indigenous peoples. It's not necessarily that long ago that that wasn't the case, but now there's no question. And in fact, for most of them, their corporate social responsibility programs are very um, detailed on dealing with Indigenous people, particularly in relation to relocation and so on. Not so in the World Heritage System. Now, this is one of the sort of crowning ironies of this whole uh, scene that I'm describing. This is the international organisation set up to deal with people and culture. Yet, in the World Heritage System, or more, more accurately, amongst certain member states, which we call states parties, in the World Heritage System, there is a question, a question about the existence of world uh, of uh, Indigenous people. Okay. So while the World Heritage Committee, so and the World Heritage, uh, or both WHCs, the World Heritage uh, Committee and the the uh, Permanent Secretariat, and both the ABs, the advisory bodies, have moved a very long way on Indigenous issues. Efforts to establish formal mechanisms to, to recognise and deal with Indigenous matters have never worked. So in 2000, I think it was, in Australia, when they had a World Heritage Committee meeting in Australia, uh, local and other Indigenous people got together and proposed the formation of a World Heritage Indigenous Peoples Committee of Experts, WIPCO. And it had legs for about an hour and a half and was then, well, those legs were then pretty well cut out from underneath it owing to extremely strong objections from a, a variety of states' parties on the World Heritage Committee at the time. Initially, the US and France, those bastions of liberty, fraternity and equality, but also most Asian countries, most African countries, India, China, they were absolutely adamant that they would not recognise Indigenous people in this way. Okay. because it comes down to issues of sovereignty. And one observer of the committee meeting at the time said he'd never really understood how fragile state sovereignty can be. Now, the other irony is that most of these, of these countries that, that reject the existence within their borders of Indigenous people, it's fine for other people to have Indigenous people, they don't. Most of them are actually signatories to the um, unfortunately named UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. UNDRIP, they should have really got a better acronym than that, but it's a very important document. All of these countries are signed up to it, but large numbers of them just reject out of hand that there are Indigenous interests to be dealt with through the World Heritage System because it's a threat to national sovereignty. Interestingly, the World Bank understands that that is in fact the case, that there are these countries that don't recognise uh, indigenous population, they might call them something else or not recognise them at all. The World Bank understands that's a problem, but unlike the World Heritage System, the World Bank says to those countries, okay, we'll go with the flow, we understand that you won't call them indigenous people, but you will produce programs to the same standard for a, that group of people, whatever we call them. So here is you know, one of the supposed sort of devils incarnate uh, of, of the Western capitalist system doing something that the organisation set up to look after people's cultural heritage won't do. OK, next thing, that Indigenous heritage warrants attention. Again, this is principally a problem of world heritage. This is going to be a bit of a boring trope here. Okay, the World Bank and global corporations, all, all the majors at least, all expressly identify and link Indigenous interests and cultural heritage. Not necessarily that well, as Andy and I have been working recently on revisions to uh, the World Bank stuff and looking back at the IFC uh, safeguards and performance standards. Quite often they'll say, yes, there's Indigenous cultural heritage, refer to document X. And when you get to document X, it refers you back to the document that you just came from. But at least they talk about it. At least they understand that it's a problem and we can work on them. In the World Heritage System, it's just really still an argument. The World Heritage List 
is dramatically imbalanced in favour of monumental architecture and particularly European monumental architecture. The Chinese are giving it a good, good go, but generally of the thousand and whatever it is sites now that we have, nearly all of them are cultural sites in Europe. There are more Spanish and French cathedrals and Italian palazzos than you can poke a stick at. Okay. Indigenous stuff, yeah. Archaeological stuff, yeah. Okay. Now we're working, a number of us, to rebalance the list. But ICOMOS, this is the official statutory body for the cultural dimensions of world heritage, has no indigenous specialist committee, no indigenous specialist representatives in any of its 30 plus international scientific committees, which are what do all the work for ICOMOS. So I'm Secretary General, as George said, of, of one of them, the International Scientific Committee on Archaeological Heritage Management. Because of the people that are on it, we involve Indigenous people. We're staffed by different people, different outcomes. Okay. And in fact, as recently as 2011, and I know it's still going on now, at the, not the last, but the second last uh, General Assembly of ICOMOS in Paris, there was almost fistfights on the floor of the uh, General Assembly meeting over the issue of whether we should include anybody, Indigenous or other community people at all in cultural heritage, because ICOMOS doesn't have the word people in it. It's Council of Monuments and Sites. And in fact, there, it's, it's a lot of this is, as I said in my interview for this uh, program earlier, a lot of this is loaded onto Australia because I think we sort of stick our heads up. But I know Canadians do it as well, as well as uh, Kiwis and people from the States. But um, it's seen as uh, the fault of Australians, basically, in the system, because Australia has a huge representation in Ikemon, that this whole emphasis on communities and Indigenous people in particular has come to the fore. And people will swear at you quite violently in these meetings and walk out. So it's, it's an interesting kind of situation. As I said, you would think, the opening years of the 21st century, that we dealt with all this. No. Okay. Curiously, IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the, the, the advisory body for nature in the World Heritage System, does a whole lot better on culture than the ICOMOS, the cultural body, particularly in relation to indigenous interests, not so much with, with uh, other forms of, of cultural heritage, but certainly with relation to indigenous heritage, the IUCN had multiple uh, intersecting specialist groups expressly dealing with indigenous matters. And they have to be quite careful because it's not in their charter. Uh, and there's also a bit, a bit like the Ikemos thing where it's monuments, not people. In Ikemos, you know, you see, and there's still a bit of a lingering fortress conservation idea. You know, the old Yellowstone model where you chuck all the people out. But despite that, there is a, a much stronger uh, and much better organised and better funded, better run program for supporting indigenous cultural heritage in the body that's not actually set up to do it. Which is the reason why I'm also a commissioner in a couple of IUCN commissions. Okay. Curious situation on the global context. Third point, that indigenous people own indigenous heritage. You would think that the world heritage system is again a problem. In addition to those sovereignty issues for nation states that I mentioned, there's a double whammy in the World Heritage System for Indigenous folk, and I'll come back to that at the end when, if I've got time to look at some examples. But World Heritage is actually a government-to-government -government thing. And so what's called the States Party, the nation state actually does the nominating. So for Indigenous people to get their stuff on the World Heritage list, as is happening, for example, in Manitoba uh, at the moment with the, uh, the uh, case over there, they have to cede control to the national government. They also, however, once they're listed, have to cede, at least in a notional sense, control to what the conspiracy theorists would think of as the world government, the black helicopters, that kind of stuff. Okay, with this universalizing mission in the name of all humanity. So how can indigenous people own the heritage of all mankind? How can it work the other way around, though, as they would say? How can all mankind own indigenous heritage if, by definition, Indigenous heritage is entirely kind of locally rooted. It's a really difficult question that upsets a lot of Indigenous folk that I know that work with the, with the World Heritage System. 
because on the one hand, they're being told that their heritage belongs to everybody. And they're being expected on that basis to let everybody, in a notional abstract sense, exercise some form of control over their, their own heritage. Okay, next thing, that Indigenous permission, FPIC, is required to work with Indigenous heritage. The need for FPIC is absolutely uncontested by the World Bank and by major global corporations. It's just not an issue. Okay. They all have fail safes and in the new, um, um, what do you call it, safeguard for Indigenous people, it basically says in words of one syllable, if there's no FPIC, there's no project. Again, not so the World Bank. It's not mentioned in any doctrinal uh, material in the World Bank system. The idea of informed consent is just not on the radar. In some of the documentation, consultation with local communities, including Indigenous people, is encouraged. It's not mandatory. Even if it's dealing with Indigenous heritage. Okay. Now, sometimes this is overcome by, um, usually accidentally, by national legislation enabling world heritage on the ground, but it's certainly not consistent, and as I said, it's certainly not required. So unlike a situation where the World Bank or Broken Hill Proprietary Limited Mining just go, no FPIC, no project, which is sometimes honoured more in the breach than the Commission, but they've got the rule there. Just not the case in world heritage. To the point that in 2011, and I know this goes on, the UN uh, Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples issued a, as you can read there, a joint statement on continuous violations of the principle of FPIC in the context of the World Heritage Convention. Doesn't get much more of a slap down than that. As I said, it's a repetitive trope, but this is the group that's supposed to deal with human heritage. Okay. And finally, that Indigenous approaches to Indigenous heritage should be respected and adopted. Okay, World Heritage again. I will admit, of course, that the, what the World Bank says should happen and what actually happens, or what a mining company says should happen and what actually happens on the ground, are not necessarily the same thing, but they have mechanisms to hold them to account, which we do do. Okay? World Heritage System. Okay still having problems with, despite significant moves to, to overcome the problem, the World Heritage System really has a lot of difficulty with non-standard approaches to heritage, particularly indigenous approaches to heritage management. One major issue which has come to the fore in the, the uh, Manitoba case is the separation of nature and culture. That it's really in, inherent in the way the world heritage system works, because although the convention, it's the World Heritage Convention 72, doesn't really separate nature and culture, the way the ABs, the advisory bodies work, IUCN and ICOMOS, they may as well be on different planets. So I go out and do joint missions, I've just come back from one, joint missions where unless the, the two people on the mission kind of subversively decide to do a joint report and send it in, the reports never meet. They go into different systems in different directions and it's, it's kind of by accident that they come back together at the end. And for Indigenous people, this is an enormous difficulty. And it's the, one, it's the reason that the Manitoba case fell over or was deferred is because the people, I'm not, I won't go into it because it's current, but the people who were writing the documentation thought they were writing it in the way uh, that the World Heritage System would deal with best, but it didn't in fact represent the way that the local people wanted it done, and so it just turned into a, a big mess, basically. And uh, colleagues have come over to talk to the people uh, involved. I met a, a group of them in Sydney uh, just before Christmas, and we're moving forward on it. But this nature versus culture thing, which is, is embedded in the way that the World Heritage System is set up and operates, is a, a huge stumbling block for Indigenous people, and yet the, the system is finding it incredibly difficult to get around it in a formal way, which I'll come back to in a sec. Again, IUCN is better at doing this, despite the, you know, the Yellowstone model, but there's still a long way to go even there. 
Okay, there's also a bit of a danger, and IUCN people don't like me saying this, but there's a bit of a danger with the IUCN's kind of mission creep into, into culture that because they're technically there to deal with the fauna and flora, it'll take us back to the old days that Indigenous people were part of the fauna and flora. Okay. And so we've got to be careful, if you like, with this mission creep in IUCN. We've got to make sure that they don't, in fact, go down that path, despite their good intentions. Okay, so how are we getting around these issues? It sounds entirely negative kind of um, you know, drum beating, but in fact we are making progress, if only in a kind of off-the-radar black ops kind of way. These organisations have been around for a long time, they're very set in their ways, they've got you know, UN conventions which are incredibly difficult to change. They have policy documents, however, that you can change. There's a thing called the Operational Guidelines for the Implementation of the World Heritage Convention. That's modifiable. So that's what we look at, modifying, and we modify it where we can on the basis of evidence. Well, that's what we try and do. But the systems are not set up to provide themselves with evidence. So the IUCN will go, oh, this is a really good idea. Cultures, you know, we've got to look after Indigenous people. Can we have some money for it? No. ICOMOS, you don't even think about asking for money. They've got barely enough to feed that cat that I mentioned. <laughs> Okay. But there's a number of ways we can move things forward. The first is that we all sit down and we agree that whatever else this is, it's a matter, it's a question of basic ethical behaviour. Okay. It's a matter of justice and autonomy. And I've got these back to front. Non-maleficence means not doing harm. Beneficence means doing good. So it's not just you don't hurt people by your actions, you actually try to do some good. So what we're doing is based on that set of principles. We've got to agree to that. We also have to accept the glocal. It's one of those terms coined originally um, in the context of Japanese marketing. Japanese are the masters of the glocal. Everybody has a Toyota wherever they live in the world. Yeah? In the World Heritage context, it's understanding that the indigenous and the local can be of global importance if it's the indigenous localness, to coin a horrible term, that's understood as the universal value. It sounds like a contradiction in terms, but in fact, you can get your head around it. It's putting the local out there as a universal value. And people, are, in the centres of these organisations have an enormous amount of difficulty with that. But we're moving them in the right direction in ways that I'll show you in a sec. The other thing is that it's flowing from this idea of the global, that the local Indigenous can be of outstanding universal value, is that ownership of Indigenous, indigenous ownership of Indigenous heritage is in, inherent in that value. It can't be Indigenous unless Indigenous people own it. Definitionally. Okay. The other thing is, flowing from that, thinking in terms of what um, the Head of World Heritage for IUCN calls whole sites, where you deal with the natural and cultural elements together. You don't have this lot doing this and that lot doing that, never the twain shall meet. All sites have dimensions of both. Okay. The other thing is that we recognise that there's a need for two-way translation. Both bottom-up, Indigenous people in this instance telling people in the centre what to do, and people in the centre saying, well, this is what we have to achieve within the boundary set for us by this convention, let's try and work in the middle. And while you, I call, use the term translation because it often is a matter of actual literal translation, translating from English or French, or translating into English and French. If you read the French version and the English version of a lot of these documents, they don't actually say the same thing. Okay. Well, they don't mean the same thing, which is why you have to have a kind of conceptual translation as well. I mean, me going to someone in the middle of the desert in Australia or the highlands of New Guinea trying to explain world heritage. You know, I'm a fluent pigeon speaker. It's still difficult. Okay? So you've got to be prepared not to just read the words, in a different language, but actually try and get the sense of the words and get them across. And that's got to go in both directions. People in Paris 
and Geneva have just as much trouble understanding what people in, I don't know, Manitoba think as the other way around. So it's a two-way translation. Now, recognising all of those things, we've got a few things on the boil at the moment. I've still got time, George. Mostly to do with me, but that's because I'm doing it. Okay. One is the Rio Tinto project, Why Cultural Heritage Matters. You can just Google that, you'll see it. It's in multiple languages now. It's about basically a conspiracy between me and an ex-student of mine who runs cultural heritage in Rio Tinto to get them to behave, essentially, on a global scale. And we tried it with WAC and it didn't really work for a variety of reasons, so uh, we did it a different way and I pulled together an international group of colleagues, both native peoples and professional archaeologists, people like the late Willem Willems and so on, people from all over the world who, amongst other things, had to constantly remind me, Ian, this isn't Australia, which was actually a really useful thing. Um, and we worked with a group of people inside Rio to produce a document that tells Rio staff all over the world what they've got to do for cultural heritage, regardless of what the local laws say, if they're not up to, to uh, what Rio believes is standard. Uh, they have a similar thing for Indigenous people, they have a similar thing for women and so on. It's what they call global corporate guidance. And I figure if we can get the likes of Rio Tinto, which is what, the second largest mining company in the world, to sign up to something like that, Rio Tinto has a big presence in the ICMM, the overarching mining body. It will flow into there. Their other colleagues will go, oh, well, wait a minute, if Rio Tinto can make a business case for this, we can make a business case for this. Or we can go to them and say, they do it, you do it. Okay. Takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of goodwill, takes a lot of 10 steps forward, you know, 25 steps back. But you just keep at it. Okay, so corporates is one thing. Working with the development banks. It's not only encouraging people to work together to respond to reviews of safeguard programs and environmental uh, uh, and, and social responsibility programs, it's actually hammering at the banks all the time. Okay? I've been at the World Bank for about 10 years. Okay? Why haven't you got a person appointed to look after cultural heritage? Why aren't you doing this? Do, please do that. Let's meet with us. So the SAA, the Society for American Archaeology, recently hung a meeting with the World Bank and the International, what is it, the Inter-American Development Bank and other um, regional and global lenders off the annual SAA meeting in, in South America, in Peru. We got them all in the one room. It's the first time it's ever happened. And it's because Jeff Altschul, the outgoing president of SAA, has been working with me on this for quite a while, understands what's happening. We had a meeting in Istanbul at the EAA's European Archaeological Association in September, and a whole bunch of presidents of these, we call it the president's group, we've got a little email group. We all met over lunch, and we say, okay, SAA's doing it, EAA, it's your turn now. Or who, you know, IPA, the one that I run in Asia. Okay, it's your turn now. And so not only do we go after the World Bank constantly, but we then also go out to the regional banks, the Asian Development Bank, whoever, and say, the World Bank's doing it. You've got to do it. But it's... Okay. World Heritage. Now, this is the one that I've been whining about through the whole talk. And despite the fact that I'm part of it, I'm trying to be part of the solution rather than continuing part of the problem. Now, one of the things that World Heritage has done is set up a thing called upstream processes. And there's 10 projects which were floundering around the world and had been deferred and so on, knocked back. And they selected these 10 to inject people like me into their nominating process to see if we can't, um, or do this translation business basically, find out what people on the ground want from the world, or what they think the World Heritage System is all about, what they want from it, convey that up, but then convey back down, if you like, from Paris and Geneva, what's expected in terms of the World Heritage Con Convention and try and make it all meet in the middle. So I've just come back from the Batanes out in somewhere. Um, I forget where I am sometimes. Sometime between the Philippines and Taiwan, the people that live there are native Taiwanese, but they're part of the, part of the Philippines. Very interesting place. 
like non-Chinese native Taiwanese. And we have been working with them, and I'll show you in a minute, um, to actually say, okay, if you want a World Heritage Site, what kind of World Heritage Site do you want? What do you think it should be? What are the values that you want represented on the world stage? Here's what you can do in the World Heritage System. How can we work with that? And these upstream kind of support missions, as they're called, are one way of, of moving the system forward. We also have a project set up um, between IUCN and ICOMOS. It's one of these kind of off-the-books off the ones. Um, it's, it's kind of semi-official, but I think it's one of those ones where if we screw up, they just deny all knowledge that we exist, that kind of thing. Um, but we've brought together basically IUCN's capacity to attract money with ICOMOS's statutory role as the cultural kind of organisation to try to connect the practice of the two advisory bodies. It's got this blurb that you can read there. But basically what it is is a bunch of people like me, Indigenous people, people from other parts of the world, getting in rooms together. I can't go to the next one. It's in, in Germany shortly. Um, but there was just one in Geneva, the first one. And we've got a series of trial projects around the world. You can Google this thing. You can see it. We've got one in Ethiopia, one in... Eastern Russia, Western China, in that neck of the woods, and one somewhere else. I can't remember the other one. Oh, Mexico, Yucatan. And we're looking at these issues of bringing nature and culture together, bringing local community perspectives to the centre of the world heritage um, process. And in, the mean, in, in, in doing so, working out ways that these two advisory bodies, which hitherto have not worked, you know, they don't play well together, making them get in a room and making them play well together. And it's only possible because of the personal efforts, basically, of people like the current head of World Heritage for, the, for IUCN, Tim Badman, he's the guy that came up with the term whole sites, people like Crystal Buckley, the outgoing uh, international um, vice president of ICOMOS, but they're kind of off the grid in the official, in terms of how the official system works. But hopefully, We'll get it going. The other thing that various people around the world are doing, and I'll talk about mine because I, I know it, are doing individual research projects at the national and international level. So I've just got a three-year grant from the Australian Research Council, which brings together people who are, coincidentally, but it's part of the, part of the, the way it's done, people from ICOMOS, me and, and one other person, and people from IUCN, who happens to be at my university, together to look at what benefits World Heritage could bring to Indigenous people. But it's not a matter of us just going out and making something up. What we're doing is going round to a, a, a selection of Indigenous communities associated with current World Heritage sites, which are managed, in which Indigenous values are managed differently. So the sites might be nominated for entirely natural values but they still, because it's Australia, they still include Indigenous values in the day-to-day -day management. How does that work? How does it work at Uluru, which is uh, nominated for, and since a renomination, is nominated for Indigenous values? How does it work in Southwest Tasmania, where it's nominated for Indigenous archaeological values? But technically, Indigenous people aren't involved. So we're going to go and talk to the local community there. I think as we speak, one of my co Researchers is on her way to Taswija to talk to people down there. So we're going to find out from Indigenous people what they want. And using a mechanism designed by the IUCN guy, a guy called Mark with a C, Hawkins, who's the kind of IUCN guru on measuring management effectiveness in protected areas, we're going to take his measurement instruments and kind of empty them out and give them to the Indigenous communities and say, if you were doing this, what would you do? What would you put in that instrument to measure what you think is important? Hopefully it'll work. We're spending a lot of money on <laughs> trying to find out. Okay? But that's just one. There are other similar projects around the world where we're bringing people with the right interests and expertise together and going out and try, try to move the system forward. Now, this is not technically anything to do with ICOMOS, IUCN, UNESCO, other than the fact that coincidentally there's a bunch of ICOMOS and IUCN people in it. But believe me, when the results of this are in, it gets injected back into the system. 
Another one is the SNIS project that we're piggybacking off the ARC project, which is the Swiss Network for International Science or something like that, studies. It's the Swiss Overseas Research Funding Body. And a Swiss guy in IUCN um, has got me and a bunch of people in Australia, some in Nepal, some in the Philippines, and some somewhere else, Vietnam, where he is at the moment, looking at similar sorts of issues, specifically um, human rights practices in world heritage across the Asia Pacific. So again, not technically an IUCN or ICOMOS or UNESCO project, but involving the right kind of people and people who will be able to put the results back into the system. Now we're actually doing that now, how are we doing for time? In a variety of places, which I'll run through. I have to be a bit circumspect because some of them are still in, like happening. And that's the reason I'm not talking about the Canadian case as well. Okay, so Papua New Guinea, Cook. It's actually an archeological uh, world heritage site. It's out there. It's 10,000 years of agriculture in one spot. Okay, under the ground, it used to be in colonial times a tea research station and they dug a lot of drainage channels because it's a swamp. And when they were digging them, they discovered ancient drainage channels dating back to say 9,000 9, years at the oldest, coming up in, in various phases of evidence up till now, but essentially 10,000 years of people developing agricultural practices in the same spot. Now, the difficulty, I don't know how well you can see this group here, group of local Highlander people, plus this guy here, John Muke. Muke is a local man, speaks local language, has a PhD from Cambridge in Britain. Has the strangest accent you can imagine. But in terms of translation, he's the man, okay? Because he can do the whole cultural heritage thing with the best of them at PhD level and talk about it in the local language, in the local dialect. And it's having these kind of pivot, pivotal people, in many senses of that word, to do this two-way translation that's going to try and make this work. And the ARC project, I have one of my colleagues is a fluent Pichichinjara speaker, so he'll be able to go out and talk to people at Uluru in pit, rather than me try and do it, I don't know, by signs or something. So the other thing that we did here, and this was a, this involved a pretty intense backwardsing and forwardsing with ICOMOS in Paris, was getting the management system, and there's one other case in the Pacific, uh, East Rennell Island, getting the management system uh, organised entirely on traditional or customary um, methods. Basically because Papua New Guinea, not to put too fine a point on it, is utterly dysfunctional, uh, and so the chances of having national or provincial uh, input of any real sort, despite lots of goodwill, the chances are nil. So you've actually got to get local people to run it, and the only way they're going to know how to do it is on their own terms. And as I said to Ikemos, well, they've been doing it for 10,000 years. I think they may have the hang of it. But trust me, it took a lot of going backwards and forwards about that issue. Will they do this? Will they do that? The only reason it's there is because they've been looking after it in a way that has produced what we are seeking to protect. So, of course. Okay. Whether it works in the long run remains to be seen, largely because we're still, as with so many international development sort of oriented things, as soon as the international organisations walk away, all the funding and the interest goes and the project may well fall over. So it's a matter of keeping an eye on this um, to make sure that the support continues. Okay, another one that I did um, for the US this time out in the western part of Hawaii. That's where normal Hawaii ends. That's the rest of it, going out past Midway. Long history as a protected area. These two islands here, it used to be called something else, but Mokumanamana and Nihoa, um, were what Pacific archeologists sometimes still, I think, refer to as mystery islands. Islands that had um, signs of, of uh, occupation, but no people when Europeans first turned up. Neka and Nahoa, uh, so they're very hard to get onto. We went out there, I had a look at those. The archaeology is just, I mean, it's interesting, but it's not World Heritage archaeology. What is interesting, however, are the indigenous values, the native Hawaiian values invested in these islands, and that was my job, was to somehow translate 
those values into language that the World Heritage System could understand and get the Native Hawaiian people to understand how the World Heritage System would deal with it. It was quite difficult. That woman there was running the show. She's a Native Hawaiian. She's also a senior administrator in NOAA, you know, the NASA of the sea kind of thing. However, she was seen to represent uh, one group of Hawaiians, another group of Hawaiians led well, most vociferously on the, at the time by this guy, um, Nahoa um, Thompson, who runs a, a canoe reconstruction, revitalization program. And he basically took us out in this canoe off, off uh, Diamond Head, far enough for us not to be able to dive in and swim back, and then gave it to us both barrels. He, why were we there? What the hell was World Heritage coming to Hawaii telling Native Hawaiians what to do with their heritage? He owned it, not Paris, da da da. And it went on and on and on. The interesting thing was that this guy here, Richard, is a French senator from Tahiti. They want a World Heritage site in Tahiti. He, was, he came along for the ride to see how it all was panning out. So the comp politics were really extremely complex. There's still ongoing court cases by part of the Hawaiian community, um, um, not this guy, but other ones, about the World Heritage Zone. It's to do with ownership and so on. But it's actually, as I ex tried to explain to the Paris, it's actually an internal Hawaiian community debate more than, more than anything else. Okay? But here is a classic case where the whole idea of World Heritage had not been well what's the word, well discussed, roundly, thoroughly discussed with local people, so they had no idea what had just been landed on them. Despite the fact that Native Hawaiians were central to the nomination, so it's kind of a complex system, but we're working on it and as a result of that, people down on the big island of Hawaii where there's still active volcanoes, this one here is a ritual going on, are talking about um, how they can get the cultural values of the volcanoes recognised uh, on World Heritage as well as the existing World Heritage listing for natural values. So despite the internal kind of dynamics, I think we had a bit of a score in that people, a large section of the, the native Hawaiian community, not only see the value of the, the uh, first nomination, but also see the value of World Heritage elsewhere in Hawaii. Okay, go here before you die. It's the southern rock islands of Palau. It's got to be one of the most beautiful places on the planet. It does look like that that is not photoshopped. Okay. It was first nominated, or the nomination was first written, as was the case in Hawaii, for natural values, lots of coral. Okay. But late in the piece, the cultural values were kind of tacked on. So there's lots of sites on those islands, but the sites, like the sites in Neka and Nahoa in Hawaii, are pretty ordinary. From an archaeological point of view, they're interesting, but they're not going to stop the traffic. However, the native Palauan values invested in these islands, as witnessed by the archaeology, or the presence of archaeology, are in fact what, has, what went forward. Because all Palauans believe that they, as a, as a people, emerged from these islands. So it's got huge kind of cosmological significance, as do the Western Islands of Hawaii for Native Hawaiians. So it wasn't the fact that there's sites, and some of them are pretty damn impressive sites size-wise on these horrible rocky islands. And they look like, like, like nice there, but when you go inside, it's like thornbush heaven. <laughs> I'd, I'd come out looking like I'd been swimming through razor blades. <laughs> but the archaeology was you know, big and extensive, but it wasn't that that did it. What did it was the fact that those sites represent something profoundly important to all living Palauans everywhere. And that's what the values were that we put up to the World Heritage Committee. And interestingly, this place suffers from tourism overkill. They, people believe that bathing in the, the sand in those lagoons is good for their skin. It's actually parrotfish poo. Parrotfish eat coral <laughs> and poo it out. And that's... <laughs> But you don't tell them that. OK. So a lot of tourism pressure. It was really important that we did something there. But also, interestingly, again, as when this one was nominated, people started to think these are the famous money stones of Yap. They're actually mined in Palau and taken to Yap. Okay. And there's a World Heritage um, nomination in process. It got knocked back the first time. 
We've now done the other one. People can go back on the basis of the experience of the, the Palau one. We can do this joint one. It's quite a complex one because it's cross country, two countries involved, involving the, the shell money. It's, those of you in the room, some of you will know uh, Christoph Sand. He's the one doing a lot of the work on this. So people, once you get the message across and people in both directions, at the top and at the bottom, so to speak, understand what it's about, people get excited and want to do more. The Big Island is covered in these things, these giant hill forts. I don't know whether you can see it very well up there. And I thought there was only one. I thought, well, yeah, you'd probably get that up for World Heritage. And they said, oh, no, the whole island's covered in them. So maybe we'll have to go for a giant kind of multi-site nomination if they go forward. But the point of showing you this is that people initially completely uncertain about World Heritage nomination. One of the players actually said to me, this has got a really strong case of getting up on natural value. We don't think the cultural values are any good. If it fails on, what he actually said to me was, if it fails on culture, we know where you live. Okay. Went from that to, oh, we've got one over here. We've got one over there. Okay. So getting it right works for people. This is a current one which I won't go on about, but there's a bunch of sites up here. They are more, there's some on the bottom of Hokkaido as well. Um, they're Jamon sites hunter-gatherer sites from the terminal Pleistocene to about 2,500. The Japanese want to nominate them for World Heritage listing. And there's a very strong um, belief that Jomon sensibilities are at the root of modern Japanese sensibilities. Big problem from an archaeological point of view is that not only is the Jamon really old, it's not really here or there, but it's actually linked with ancestral Ainu, not with ancestral ethnic Japanese. Does everyone know who the Ainu are? Native, non-Japanese, so to speak, ethnic Japanese, Japanese. Same way that there's native, non-Chinese, Taiwanese. Okay. The ethnic Japanese probably only arrived in the last couple of thousand years, post Ainu. There's been a lot of into mixing and so on, of course. But it's only in the last few years that the, the Japanese have actually acknowledged that the Ainu are an indigenous group. They are nonetheless pursuing this nomination with no reference to Ainu people. No reference to the complexities of history. Rather, they are constantly saying, well, and it's in all the World Heritage documents that they've shown to us, it's that Jumon particularly, i.e. non-ethnic Japanese people, are central to modern Japanese identity. They've in fact been persecuted for a very long time. It's only very recently they've been, been acknowledged as a separate group and so on and so forth. So we've got very clear kind of ownership and appropriation issues happening here, exacerbated by nationalist claims. Right-wing nationalists actually hold kind of Nazi-ish rallies at these, some of these sites for this reason, that the Jamon is part of the soul of Japan. For World Heritage, this is a really complicated issue. Okay. It's a sort of thing that, yes, we have it in Australia and Canada and New Zealand and places like that, but there, Indigenous people are recognised and at least belatedly there's mechanisms for incorporating Indigenous interests in things like World Heritage. In Japan, it's a really different and difficult scene. How are we going to get through this? I'm not really sure, because every time we would give what they asked for, frank and fearless advice, we were told that it didn't translate into Japanese, figuratively speaking, conceptually. So another one is Batanas, where I've just come back. Oh, sorry, and there's this other thing where they keep reconstruct, doing these kind of romantic reconstructions. There's some scientific programs going on where they, they reconstruct it and then see what happens. But they actually, for tourists, build all these, these things, which are actually just copies of historically documented Ainu sites. But they're unproblematically described as Jamon and as Japanese. And this whole idea of reconstruction is a big issue for World Heritage, because you're not supposed to do it. There's a, a crucial thing in World Heritage called authenticity and integrity, and that's not it there. Okay. 
And Batana is a really interesting place. They tried in 2006, got knocked back. They tried as a cultural landscape, which is a particular kind of World Heritage Site. It's brought in in, um, I forget when, 1990, I think, to try and broaden out World Heritage and, and include Indigenous uh, interests particularly uh, more effectively. There's still only, I think, five Indigenous cultural landscapes out of quite a few on the World Heritage List. But they tried as a, a cultural landscape, but it was written by an architect and so it didn't really capture the essential characteristics of um, the local indigenous culture that would have got it uh, up as a successful nomination. So we've gone back, and well, we went back to do this upstream support mission, and they said, oh, look, we don't want to do culture anymore. Look, we're going to go nature. And the IECN guy basically just said, you haven't got a leg to stand on. It will not get up on a natural only uh, thing. You really got to go back to thinking about culture. And they started to get really worried about it. And I said, well, it's just because of the way it was done previously. So into translator mode, I went, here is the document, here is the convention, here is the operational guidelines. And the IUCN guy was fantastic as well with this. He'd worked uh, all over the world. He ran the Mount Everest National Park, very cool guy. Um, and we explained to people, and look, this is a meeting here with local shamans here. One of the, I can't know if you can see her. That woman there is the National Congresswoman. For the, she's actually the one behind the World Heritage nomination. But explaining to people, in their villages, to the extent that we could, in their languages, um, what was going on. So that they had a much better understanding. Once local people had a better understanding, they could actually tell people like the Congresswoman what they wanted, rather than her telling them. And it made a, a lot of difference. So we went out there and said, well, look, you've got these amazing archaeological sites, indigenous archaeology. This is a big fort here. It's, in t it's, it's a, a lava, big pile of lava, not lava, what do you call it? Volcanic. Um, um, soft volcanic rock, basically, which they've carved into that shape. And they, they would have, there's a village over the back, a stone village over the back and so on. So there's this wonderful landscape. Um, people are still living a relatively um, traditional life uh, to the extent that anyone does in the late, uh, this late period. But we can still go and have conversations you know, with fishing shaman and so on. Let's go down that route, okay? We can bring in natural features because it is a landscape, it's a cultural landscape, so we've got to talk about the interaction of people in their landscape. Okay? So let's think about it in this way, this matter of translation. So from arriving to this state of confusion and panic, we we're there for about 10 days, dealing with people on the ground, in their own terms, in their own language, you're able to come out at the end and say, okay, panic's over, let's do it this way. And people are really excited and interested. So while the system as a whole, I'll wrap up now, while the system as a whole is still structurally um, unable to deal effectively with Indigenous cultural heritage, whether it's issues of ownership or the adoption of Indigenous approaches to world heritage, uh, to cultural heritage management, or the, the, need, the acknowledgement of the need for uh, informed consent, there are nonetheless on the ground efforts happening amongst people who want to change things, which will push back into the system and eventually make the whole system change. And so while a lot of my talk today has been a complaint, <laughs> a litany of complaints about the World Heritage System, it's, it recognises that it's got a problem and it's supporting people like those that I mentioned today that I work with to actually fix it. It can't kind of do it itself, but it's letting us do it. And I think that's a really positive, positive uh, uh, situation to be in. It'd be great if they turned around tomorrow and said, yeah, it's all fixed, we'll rewrite the convention, we'll do this, we'll do that. They can't do that. It's essentially, it's impossible. But what they're letting us do is this kind of, yeah, it's a bit off the radar, but it's happening. And it will change the system. So on that positive note, I would encourage you all to look into this stuff, whether it's in Canada or outside, look into how these global bodies work, how they affect what you do, and see what you can do to affect how they operate. Because only people like us in this room are going to make those things change. Thank you.
Um, ultimately, heritage is always local. And what, what Ian has allowed us to do is to consider local heritage in a global context. And we see the value, but we also see the challenges of that. We have time for questions, so uh, we'd like to go ahead with that. Uh, Rupert, would you do the honors, please? Yeah. The home of the case. Thank you. Uh, you cleared up a number of things for me, and I appreciate that in terms of a lot of the acronyms and organizations. Uh, I'm wondering in, in your work and how you, you gave those case study examples to, to really uh, bring all this home. Um, but I'm wondering, in terms of sovereignty, that, that's a big term here in Canada for First Nations people and our, our struggles in negotiating with various levels of government. And I'm wondering if you've uh, considered or looked at um, the works of Tatanki Alfred and uh, how he's articulated in a, in a legal political sense uh, his views of sovereignty and uh, how the, the very definition of that term is uh, very much in contrast to the federal government here in Canada mm -hmm. and uh, pr provinces mm -hmm. and different levels of government. And uh, 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 if you haven't, I encourage you to do mm -hmm. that because I, I, I think it speaks to a lot of what you've uh, talked about this evening, in, in particular the, the, uh, the global, which I think is a, cool. is a great term. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point because there, there's quite a lot of interesting work on sovereignty and which I'm just starting to get into. I mean, you're looking at a guy who's really a dirt archaeologist who's kind of moved into this stuff. And so I still really approach it as a, at, at a very practical level. But I'm, I'm, I'm seeing works by both native and non-native peoples talking about these issues and whether it's sovereignty or translation or these other things, broadening out our conceptions in really useful ways. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll um, follow that up. So thank you. Uh, thanks for that. Um, who, who referred to indigenous people as <clears throat> wildlife? And can you give me his phone number? I think I'd like to <laughs> give him a call. No, seriously, back in the day, certainly in Australia, and I, I would strongly suspect it happened here in the States and New Zealand as well, um, there, there are famous cases of, um, I don't know, King George the X coming out to visit us. And in displays of um, fauna and flora, they would have Aboriginal people sitting. Um, another example, which I was only recently reminded of, um, this is a very interesting place in, in Stockholm that, that's very closely tied to the origins of cultural heritage protection and so on, um, where a guy went around Sweden and brought all these examples of regional architecture and stuck them in what used to be the, the Royal Hunting Reserve in, in the middle of Stockholm. That's a pretty cool place. You go there and people dress up as you know, 17th century peasants and stuff. There's also a, what they used to call Laplander, there's also a Sami bit there. And the Sami bit is in the zoo. It's in where the Swedish animals are. And until recently, Sami people were made to live there full time, unlike everybody else. So there's lots of examples of that. And my um, and in fact, so many people still work there, but on a, a much more normal basis. And the really interesting thing is I've got this photo, and I'm, I'm not picking on Sweden, it's just one that I can think of, photo of a Sami woman who's there for the day, luckily not living there, in this little Sami hut. And behind it is the grand neo-Gothic facade off in the distance of the Nordic Museum, which is about this close to a Nazi museum as you could possibly get. And, and it, I just thought the juxtaposition was really interesting. But throughout the world, where there are colonised indigenous populations, until recently and until very recently, they were commonly seen as part of the fauna and flora. And if you have an organisation that's job is to look after fauna and flora, moving into looking after indigenous people because the cultural lot won't do it or can't do it, you start to run the danger of, how would we put it, Less sympathetic, less informed people running it all together in their minds. That's my concern. And so the mission creep of the IUCN into matters cultural needs to be thought about really carefully because of that kind of issue. It's, you know, they deal with trees and bees and bugs. Oh, and indigenous people. 
Yeah, well, that, we, we don't want that. The, the reason I ask is my parents and uncles and aunts still remember signs in the bar, yeah. no Indians or dogs allowed yeah, in Canada. Yeah, exactly. Things have changed here. I was just yeah. wondering if it's changed in other parts of the world. Yeah. Not as much as we would think. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you for sharing your justice-friendly knowledge. My question is, what, uh, can you share your experience about Africa, especially areas in Tanzania where the Maasai and place like Botswana uh, are having ch uh, challenges in terms of uh, heritage because yeah, all the people are coming around trying to grab land and oh, so yeah. on. Yeah. I mean, the African case is very difficult because one of the big arguments in Africa, and that's one of the reasons why African governments object to the whole idea of indigenous people, is who's indigenous in Africa? And... and um, it becomes very, a very difficult case. And I know there are cases now, as you say, with Maasai and other people, where um, uh, there are some really extremely difficult situations evolving. And I don't really, I'm not close to those cases. Um, I've been involved in discussions about them, but I don't know the details. I know that there's a lot of heat uh, and not a small amount of violence involved, but um, there is also, yeah, as you say, people grabbing land and, and um, all sorts of other things going on, but I'm not close enough to those cases to talk about them, I'm sorry. Sure. I just had a quick question. Oh. Yeah, it's got a, yeah. You don't get out of it that easily. Hi there. Um, your slide about Japan yeah. kind of caught my attention, and I was curious, in the, with the Japanese, you're talking about ethnic Japanese yeah. being like 2,000 yeah. years or so. Does date come up with any of these organizations? Do people talk about, like, we're all used to Euro Eurocentric colon yeah. colon colonial period, but yeah. that's happened other places yeah. in the world much earlier. And does that ever get dealt with in these organizations? Um, no, not really. No. No. I mean, it, it's probably on the agenda somewhere, but there's so many other pressing things. But no, I mean, it's definitely a... a um, uh, an issue, but there's probably, how would I put it, there are other things that need to be dealt with first. But it certainly comes up in places like Australia. It's like, what, how can Aboriginal people claim stuff that's 30,000 years old? You know? But this is a little bit different, because this is like in Australia or Canada or New Zealand, European descendant you know, colonisers saying that Aboriginal stuff is theirs, you know, and that Aboriginal stuff is at the heart of European Australia. That's exactly what's happening in Japan. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I have a question. Um, is there any legal recourse that uh, indigenous communities can take against uh, the indigenous heritage organization or other such organizations? Yeah. And yeah. What, what does that look like? Uh, well, taking action against um, the world heritage bodies, um, as I said, is happening uh, in Hawaii. I'm, I'm, I've not looked into the exact details of who is suing whom. Um, but I think what actually happens is that um, the, the legal action is against the national government rather than the international organisation because the international organisation just says, well, all we do is, is kind of move paper around for national governments. We're, we're really just a shell kind of company, so to speak. And if you want to sue somebody, <laughs> sue your national government. And that happens, but it's the same as suing... Um, uh, you know, a global corporation, which people do all the time, or, or uh, the World Bank is a bit hard to sue because I think it's a bit like the UN. It's kind of a bit kind of distant, but they they have um, mechanisms for you to take action against them. Um, um, the World Bank is an amazing organisation. You can find just about anything you want to know about the World Bank online, if, mostly by accident, but you can get the minutes of meetings. You can get just about anything. It's actually a relatively for a completely non-transparent organisation, it's actually relatively transparent. <laughs> um, um, but they do have these bodies inside that you can approach, and they take their job very seriously in the main. And they will, if you make a complaint to them, um, they will deal with it. And interestingly, they won't, for example, um, who was talking to me about this recently? Someone that represents forest peoples or something. There's more NGOs out there than you can think about the deal with this kind of stuff but people like the World Bank what's it called this group anyway it's like an ombudsperson for the world ombudsman for the World Bank they won't deal with NGOs the NGOs can help in the background but they will only deal directly with the affected communities 
And so it cuts out all the middlemen, cuts out all, you know, in their minds anyway, cuts out a lot of um, fiddling, shall we say. The problem is a lot of these organisations that are trying to do the complaining don't have the resources they need, so that's why NGOs can come in behind them. But the World Bank won't talk to an NGO, they'll only talk to the affected people, which I think is actually a good system. Yeah. Hi, uh, I was just wondering, um, with in regards to the World Bank, um, would I be able to make a complaint that would be dealt with regarding our burial grounds, which are, right now there's a pipeline proposed to be if built. If the World over? Bank's funding it, yeah. Okay, they're not funding it though. Yeah. If the World Bank is funding it, you can make a complaint. Um, uh, but you may find that that a bit of the World Bank that you don't know is part of the World Bank is in fact funding it. I mean, there are all these acronyms out there. And like the IFC, um, International Finance Corporation, may well have a hand in it. Um, it's a matter of finding out uh, who's, who's actually funding. But as I said, following the money is actually a really clever strategy. Because you can go and throw rocks at the World Bank all you like. If you actually, or, or the company, I don't, know, I don't know, Chevron, for example, but if you actually go to the people that are holding the money and get them, it's, a, it, it's much, a much more effective way of pulling Chevron, who I've just pulled out of the hat, into, into line. Because Chevron will just go, we're the biggest company in the world, we don't care. You know? We just say, well, the people who've got all your money do. It works. Yeah. Slowly, but it works. Hello. Um, you mentioned authenticity at the end, mm. and then you also were talking a bit about, you know, how people have to go through these applications. And so I'm wondering if there's, you know, in producing the authenticity of yeah. these sites, yeah. if, you know, they become sealed or, or stagnate or, mm. you know, like you were talking about in PNG, the yeah. farming, like yeah. they've been farming for 10,000 years and not... Now it's a site, no more farming, or if there's no, things like that going on. That's interesting. It's a very interesting question because it's precisely the question that everyone in the Batanas asked. They said, what, so we get World Heritage and we're turned into a museum? You know? And I said, well, no, because if you read the operational guidelines and you read what the um, definitions of this particular kind of heritage landscape involve, you can continue to do your normal stuff. And people will sort of, you know, partly in play, but partly seriously go, so, you know, and they bring up food security and all this kind of jargon, and they, and can we have a 500 room hotel right in the middle? No, you cannot do that. But, you know, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that you can continue to do in a normal way. And once that was translated to them, like, if you read the document, here's what it says, this is what it means in real life on the ground, yes, you can still be an authentic, the, the, um, name for themselves is Ivatan. You can still be a legitimate, regular Ivatan and live in the 21st century. Yeah, World Heritage is not going to stop that. The problem is that in the Philippines, particularly, there are cases where that has not come to pass. And the famous um, rice terraces that some of you will have seen pictures of, um, astonishing site, just an extraordinary place. But they've basically been frozen in, in time. They've been told they can't change the kind of rice that grows there. They got it, which won't feed anybody because it's crappy ancient rice. All this kind of stuff. They are fighting to be allowed to kind of live their lives in a way that allows them to preserve the terraces, but live like you know modern human beings. And I think part of this is how the Philippines, in this case, runs World Heritage. If what they can be, because they're mainly architects, if they can be brought around to seeing uh, that people have got to live in the, in the modern world, in a, in, yes, in a way that preserves the heritage, but in a way that also lets them, you know, be authentic in the way that they define, we can go forward. But it is a, it is a bit of a trick, and I think part of it is changing the mindsets of what they call the national committees that deal with world heritage um, on what authenticity and integrity means. Yeah. That was actually a really good question. Yeah. Any other...? for one or two more questions, especially from some of my graduate students. <laughs> <laughs>
Hi there. Hi. Um, I really like the concept of this World Heritage Indigenous Peoples Committee of Experts. I'm wondering if there's any chance of revitalizing no. that. No, I, I was actually talking to people about this recently in the system, and they just said, don't use that term. You know, we're, we're, we're moving in that direction, but that term is, is, is connected with a particular thing that blew up. If we use that term, it's going to revitalise, you know, re-energise re all those horrible memories for everybody. We, yes, we're going, we're trying something else, but don't call it that. So, yeah. I have a question for you. <laughs> Sorry, I have a million questions, but cool. if nobody else has That's one, right. I can throw one more in. Yeah, yeah. Um, how is the evolution of, of Australian law with regards to these issues? Is it progressing? The last big case I recall hearing about was Mabo, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in Canada, we've had a succession of, yeah. of, of Aboriginal rights yeah. and sites cases yeah. that are famous and I believe are taught in internationally. So how, how is that going in Australia? Going reasonably well. Um, Mabo changed just about everything, um, and certainly, interestingly, it was something when we were writing that grant that I was talking about, about going out and finding out from Aboriginal people what they thought about world heritage, I don't know why, but we didn't really think explicitly about native title and Mabo and so on, and because it's now it's just part of the landscape, it's, it's you know, normal life, and, and um, then something came up. Um, one, of the, one of our case studies, Fraser Island, which is nominated for only for natural values, but has an indigenous advisory committee and so on and so forth. It in fact got, Fraser Island got native title, uh, or, or was, was given over to the local community uh, as, as a native title domain. While we were there interviewing people, and we just sort of like, you know, why didn't we think of, of what this is gonna do? And in fact, one of the, um, the civilians, so to speak, on, on one of the community advisory bodies, the non-indigenous community advisory body, Suddenly, it was like being transported back 20 years. She just said, oh, are you going to let us, you know, not let us onto the island? And you could see all the Aboriginal people just rolling their eyes and thinking, haven't we done this? You know, didn't we do this in 1990-something? And they said, no, it's OK, we'll let you on. And in fact, you know, they talked their way through it. But, but for us as the researchers, we went, oh, God, what, what does native title, in fact, mean for world heritage? Because when, you know, a lot of the sites were, were signed up uh, by the Australian government, world heritage wasn't there. Uh, sorry, uh, native title wasn't there. Now it is, um, and you know, can more and more of these groups are, that are associated with world heritage sites are getting native title over those world heritage sites. It's a, it's a whole thing that we didn't write into the proposal that we're going to have to think about. So get back to me in about three years, and I'll <laughs> and I'll tell you what the answer is. Well, let me take this opportunity to once again thank Ian for this wonderful, very informative talk. And I have a small token of appreciation for... Oh, wow, a box. For this, and, and, and something in the box of heritage. Oh, so, man, that is fantastic. So please join me in, in thanking Ian thank again. You. I would also like to acknowledge the, the support of, of President Andrew Petter, who made this uh, President's Dream Colloquium possible. And I'd also like to offer one very brief update. Uh, last week, or two weeks ago, Catherine Bell spoke on, on heritage in British Columbia and mentioned the Grace Islet case. Uh, last Thursday, the province announced that it has a settlement plan in place. A part of, of that is based on its ecological values of Grace Islet without touching on any of the cultural values. Um, last, uh, in the last presentation, we also mentioned the Declaration on Safeguarding Ancestral Burial Grounds, which you could find on the iPinch website. We are now accepting personal and organizational endorsements on that, which we think is going to be a very valuable document in moving the conversation forward. The declaration has now been endorsed by the American Anthropological Association, the Society for American Archaeology, and the Suzuki Foundation, amongst others. So I urge you to join us with uh, your endorsements. Thank you very much.